past 23 minutes before 8. Thanks so much for choosing Morning Live. Now, former Democratic Alliance leader Helen Ziller has decided to return to politics after she called it quits earlier this year. Now, Ziller, who joined the Institute for of Race Relations just um, a month ago, has now suspended her fellowship with the Institute to pursue one of the most powerful positions in the Democratic Alliance as the party's federal mm -hmm. council chair. And according to media reports, Ziller says she made her decision after various senior leaders approached her to apply for the position. Helen Zilla joins us now uh, from uh, Cape Town to talk to us about her decision. Ms. Zilla, thank you so much for speaking to us and welcome to Morning Live. Thank you very much, Sakina. Good to be with you. So if you could just uh, please explain to us um, what influenced this latest decision that you've taken to come back within the DA in a very powerful role, as it were, if you were to be elected to it. Well, the first point is the one you've just made. If I were to be elected, obviously there's going to be a free and fair election and somebody's going to be elected. I did throw my hat into the ring and I made my decision very quickly, in fact, overnight between Thursday and Friday last week. If you'd asked me earlier in the week, I would have said definitely not. But overnight, Thursday and Friday, after many people had spoken to me, I decided that it was really very important for me to have a last attempt to stabilize the DA, to unify the DA, and to ensure that the party can get back on track. It's an organization I love. It's been through tremendous turmoil and difficulties, and I just feel I can't walk away and abandon it for its sake, as it were. So when you talk about getting the Democratic Alliance back on track, what do you mean by that? What is your assessment of where the party is currently at? The big problem is that I can only read what is happening in the newspapers because I have been out of the centre fold for a very, very long time. And indeed, I work on the periphery now. I'm an ordinary member of the party. I'm a branch chair in Bloberg. And I do my best at the very grassroots level to support the party. What I've read in the newspapers has been very disconcerting. There have been many leaks, and leaks only happen when a party is deeply divided over something. So that shows me there is something wrong at the heart of the party. But Musi Maimani, the leader, appointed a review panel to analyze what is going wrong and to make recommendations. And we're all waiting for the report on those recommendations. I hope that they will analyze the situation fully and frankly and make recommendations that can be implemented. And so one will have to wait for them and I will obviously do my own diagnosis, but taking their analysis very carefully into account and move from there. So when you say you only see these sort of divisions when the party is divided over something, what do you believe that something is that the Democratic Alliance is currently divided over? Well, when a party starts going backwards in the polls, that always presses a panic button. For example, we have local government elections in two years' time. And many councillors must be worrying about whether or not they're going to be re-elected. And so when that starts to happen, people turn to the leadership. And unfortunately, in politics, the leadership can take the credit when things go well, but has to also accept responsibility when things don't go well. And then all kinds of speculations start happening. Why did we lose votes? Who's accountable for that? How do we correct course? That is the kind of debate that happens. So going back to what you said about getting the party back on track, so if you were to be elected into this position, what would you do to bring the, BA, uh, the Democratic Alliance back on track? Well, as I said, you can't start any intervention before you've got a proper diagnosis. That is critical. Otherwise, you'll start treating the wrong symptoms. Now, I do hope the review panel, who is due to submit a report in the next couple of weeks, as I believe it, will have done a very serious analysis. I know that they spoke to many, many people and received many submissions, according to media reports. So I do hope their diagnosis will be very thorough, and I hope their remedy will be based on that diagnosis. If that turns out to be the case, then it makes one's job a lot easier because then it is to use your job description to help implement those parts of the recommendations and the remedy that fall within your job description. 
Now, I was looking at the newspapers this morning. Um, the Business Day, actually, uh, this was their lead story. It says Zilla might not be eligible for the DA post. Agreement reached after colonialism uh, comments may bar her from joining the race for the federal chair. Um, what is your position on that? Um, you said uh, that you have put your hand up, you've put your name in the ring, but are you actually eligible? Has any of this been discussed by the party where you may not be eligible? I have no idea. I mean, you know, I've obviously read the agreement overnight and there's nothing in the agreement that says I'm not eligible to stand for election. So I think this is a bit of a, a red herring, actually. So uh, there's absolutely nothing, as you know, that precludes you from entering this race at this point? Absolutely nothing that I know of, no. But there are those who feel that if you were to be elected into what is a very powerful position uh, in the Democratic Alliance, that you would actually not help the cause of the Democratic Alliance because you would overshadow whoever the leader may be. What's your take on that? Well, my take on that is very simple. I've often been in backroom positions. I've often been in low-key positions. And I can fulfill those positions as well as I can fill the upfront positions. So I look at the job description, I go according to the job description, and I really don't have to be the bride at every wedding or the corpse at every funeral. I can really play a behind the scenes role, a support role, and we have a very clear job description. I don't know if that's going to change with the review panel, but there's a very clear description of the role of the chair of the federal executive. And I will look very carefully at that or any amended job description that may emerge and stick to that role, stick to that role and not try to be the leader in disguise. But, but, but would you agree with me that the position of uh, federal council chair is a very powerful position and that may bring along with it its own dynamics? Yes, you're absolutely right about that. The critical thing about the role of federal council chairperson is that it is the point where all the systems have to gel, where the gears have to mesh, as it were. So, for example, it's where the systems, the structures, the processes of the DA all come together, and if everything is working seamlessly and smoothly through that office, it really is extraordinarily important for the party. And that has happened in the last 20 years under James Self, that is why experience is very, very necessary in that position. Mazilla, are you at liberty to reveal to us who the senior DA leaders are that approached you and what exactly the reasons were that they gave to you? Well, the reasons are very clear. The DA is becoming less and less united. And we were once a reasonably strongly united organization. Obviously, there are always tensions and rifts and bits of polarization in political parties, but we were quite a strongly united organization, all charting a course in the same direction, all agreeing on the vision, and that appears to have dissipated. That appears to no longer be the case, which is the first problem. And the second thing is we are very unstable, it seems, at the moment. And with James Self stepping down, who was a stabilizing hand on the tiller, the risk of increased destabilization is very, very serious. So those were the major reasons. Now, last week, one of your former colleagues at the Institute for Race Relations said that the current leader of the DA, Musi Maimane, should step down. So what are your views on this? And, and, and do you agree that Maimane should step down? Well, the bottom line is this. Harvan Pretorius, who is a young colleague at the South African Institute of Race Relations, was asked to write a column for the online newspaper. He did that in his own voice, with his own opinion, as he's entitled to do. He didn't consult anybody. He certainly didn't consult me. I was in Cape Town at the time, and I read it just like everybody else in the online newspaper. I did not agree with his wording, but the core point he was trying to make was that race should not be the overriding determinant of leadership in the DA. And I do agree with that. 
But has race been the overriding determinant uh, for leadership in the DA? Because um, some would say that, you know, one of the elephants in the room that the DA has to deal with is, of course, this question of race. And um, uh, I've, I've been reading some of uh, the comments and, you know, some of the analysis that has been done on what's happening in the DA. And part of what comes through, people give the examples of people like Lindiwe Mazibugo, people like Mbali and Tuli, and now perhaps Musi Maimane, um, uh, uh, saying that the DA uh, publicly advance uh, these people and then suddenly they disappear. So does the DA have a problem uh, on how to deal with black people within its ranks and their ascension to leadership positions? I think that would be a very superficial conclusion, if you wouldn't mind me saying so, Sakina. I try to explain quite carefully in my book that we try to take every attribute into account, and certainly under me and under my leadership, race was one of them, and I spelled that out very clearly in my, in my book. The bottom line is that leadership attributes are far, far, far greater than the color of a person's skin, and it's those attributes that need to be the overriding consideration for leadership positions. These positions are extremely complex. They take a lot of life experience. And the three people that you mentioned are enormously talented, enormously intellectually able, and very young. And so these are major challenges. I'm not an ageist. Lots of people say I'm too old. I'm definitely not an ageist at all. But I also do believe there are stages in life for a very good reason, and that life experience is critical in these unbelievably complex roles in a deeply divided society. So one would imagine then, if, if we take Musi Maimane, for example, that if the DA had enough belief in him uh, to vote for him as the leader of the party, they would have taken that into consideration. The fact that, uh, you know, he is of a certain age, he may not have had a certain life experiences. So, so, so why would that change now? Well, the bottom line is that I was one of uh, the strongest supporters of my, Musi Maimani becoming the leader of the party. I really believed he had all the attributes, and I saw him making that brilliant, brilliant broken man speech, which I've often said will go down as one of the great speeches of South Africa's history. I think he's enormously talented and enormously able as a dynamic public speaker, etc. And in my role, if I were to be elected as chair of the federal executive, I would have, at or chair of the federal council, I would have absolutely no role in deciding on a new leader. My only role would be to support the leader. And that is what I would do to give the precise backing and support that the leader and the leadership would need from behind. So your return now uh, to active politics is, as you said, uh, to help the DA get back on track. But do you believe that Musi Maimane is the correct leader to take the DA forward? As I said, I strongly supported Musi Maimani to become the leader. I have an enormous amount invested in his success, not only for South Africa, which is number one, or for the DA, which is number two, but number three for myself. If I support and back someone, I really want them to be a success. So obviously I would very much like him to succeed. And I would very much like the party that I spent almost my whole adult life building, I would love it to succeed because I've got everything invested in it. And South Africa has two, whether people realize it or not. If the DA dies, South Africa's democracy can't succeed. And that is why I am so passionately committed to giving this a try. So, Mr. Maimane would be able to uh, rely on your support if you were elected to this position? Yes, absolutely. And any leader that were to be elected or put in place in the proper process, in the proper course of our proper processes, would be able to rely completely on my support to make them a success. So given the DA's dismal showing at the polls in the, the last election, what would you do? What do you think the Democratic Alliance should be doing to regain the trust of the voters? And, and also, where do you think the DA went wrong? Well, as I said earlier, we had an entire commission set up to investigate that. Now, I'm awaiting their report that still has to be submitted. I will read that very carefully. They have spent many weeks trying to answer that exact question. 
and my reading would only be superficial. They did an in-depth investigation speaking to many scores of people and going around the country and receiving a huge number of submissions. And they've filtered it all, they've analyzed it all, and I think that they will be in a far better position to say than me simply off the cuff. And I will start analyzing if I am elected from the point of the report of the review committee. Notwithstanding, I must say, I, I'm very keen to hear, uh, even though you um, uh, state that it would be, you know, your very superficial reading of it, but as a former leader of the party, I'm, I'm very curious to know uh, what your initial reading of that particular situation was. Well, my initial reading of that situation was that we were so busy trying to get new voters who weren't part of our political philosophy in the sense that they believed in the primacy of racial group analysis, that we forgot about the voters who have moved past race group analysis and want to build one South Africa for all. And, and, and that's a very interesting take, and it would be interesting to see how that analysis uh, bears this out. But uh, with regard to this uh, so-called black caucus within the Democratic Alliance, um, how do you think the DA should be dealing with this? Well, it's very sad if there are race-based caucuses in a party that is committed to non-racialism. I can understand people getting together certainly around ideas and policies. So, for example, if there is a study group on any policy whatsoever from healthcare to education to land, they are free to meet and they're there because they're focusing on policies and how we translate our values into policies. But when people mobilize on race, that's precisely what we're trying to enable South Africa to move beyond. Helen Ziller, so we're going to leave it there. And, uh, of course, uh, we'll be keeping a keen eye on developments. Uh, thank you so much for speaking to us this morning. And uh, that, of course, uh, conversation with uh, Helen Ziller uh, talking to us uh, from uh, Cape Town about her returning to active politics within the Democratic Alliance. And, as always, uh, we want to hear from you what your views are on this and, of course, any other stories we tackle here on Morning Live at Morning Live SABC. That's where you can get hold of us on Twitter and Facebook.